Folks, you're listening to Mr. Dave Hodges, the Common Sense Show, heard every Sunday night. Uh, go to the CommonSenseShow.com. I had a chance encounter with a, a Border Patrol officer. I, I only had a real short conversation with this man. I handed him my business card uh, that had my radio show information on it. And uh, I said, I promise I won't use your name. I'm just trying to clear up a few things. And some of your guys have been in contact with someone who I know, Dr. Jane Orient who's one of our top physicians here in Arizona, and they've been telling her that the Border Patrol is coming down with scabies, drug-resistant TB, bacteriological pneumonia, and it's all being covered up. They're doing on-site laundry so they don't carry this stuff home to their families. They're now being infected with scabies, which could be carriers for more serious things like dengue disease and stuff like that. And Dr. Orient was told something that I was told by this Border Patrol agent. He said, do you know about the 100,000 West Africans and I said, yes. And he said, do you know they're taught to speak Spanish so they'll blend in before they come here? He goes, they admitted that to us. And I said, yes. And I said, that's a CIA operation. And he said, do you know where they're from? And I said, yes, the seven-state region in West Africa where there's a live, uncontained, uncontrollable outbreak of Ebola. And on my show, Dr. Orient, who's very conservative by nature, came out and said it's not a matter of if, but when and where we have an Ebola outbreak in this country. So I've been working really hard on that, and this Border Patrol agent called me um, after he had read some articles I had written, and he said, there's more that you need to know. And I think he began to trust me because I never printed his name, and I could clearly see his badge. And this is just a chance encounter, Doug. We were traveling to San Diego, and so he calls me back, and he has a friend with him, and he tells me that the U.N. already has a presence on the border, and I said, how do you know? And he said, well, they've taken 75% of us off live border patrol duty, like we do drug busts and this and that. And he said, now we're doing clerical work where we're pretending to process these immigrants. And he said only 10% of them are, as advertised in the media, 10% unaccompanied minors. He said the rest are adults or the children are with some kind of guardian or parent. He said, that's a lie you're being told. But he said, I have to sign in to the detention centers when we go in to procure these people and then take them to an interview room. And he said he has seen the sign-in list. It's electronic. But he says, when I go to sign in, I can see, you know, the top ten names that have signed in above me. And people from the World Health Organization, DHS, as you would imagine, but also the United Nations and various departments of the United Nations are signing in at these Border uh, Patrol-controlled areas in the detention centers. And so my articles I've been writing about DHS uh, is going to roll out the U.N. when there's a pandemic, and that will be the foothold for the U.N. to gain a presence in this country that will be acceptable. But I said there has to be beyond that for the U.N. to move into the legitimate policekeeping force that they're going to claim that they are with the Russian and Chinese soldiers wearing blue helmets coming to get our guns. We do have uh, our intelligence insider uh, to directly speak to you, and, and you guys can speak. Uh, talk amongst yourselves, if you will, about this very issue. Uh, w is our intelligence insider. Ebola uh, takes out its victims very quickly. So if somebody has Ebola, uh, within literally just a matter of days at the most, they show the signs of the infection, and they don't get a chance to infect lots and lots of people before they show that they're infected and it's a little bit easier to quarantine. But there's other types of disease where the incubation period is longer. And as the incubation period gets longer, the ability for them to spread disease widely before it's suddenly detected. And then uh, uh, you can't corral it easily. Um, That's a real threat. with, if we look at these weapons, if we look at these gang members like a disease, when they come in but we don't see their actions immediately, then we don't corral them, stop that movement quickly, and it continues to spread and spread and spread. And then by the time that the first action by them is seen, it's already too late because they're so far and wide spread out and their interconnectivity uh, command and control. 
uh, they've got a chance to get themselves in place. And so that we haven't seen some horrible event happen quite yet isn't that it's a good thing. In some ways, it's a bad thing because it means that the infection is continuing to spread and continuing to get a root. And when it finally does uh, begin to show itself, we're far more vulnerable. And uh, 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 you know, this this is so invasive. What's happening to us? It's such a tremendous threat. Um, you know, so it's important. You know, and like you were mentioning with the sheriffs and other people, um, the society operates on a very thin thread of civility. And as soon as you have just a handful of people taken out, others can't go do their job, and suddenly everything we know about our type of society collapses very quickly. It, it does go into some kind of martial law type situation, and our ability to you know, get back to some kind of normative state is going to take a very long time. So um, those are real threats. Yeah, I mentioned something about the uh, Ebola incubation period. I had on my show Dr. Jane Orient, who's one of our top physicians here in Arizona where I reside, and she informed me that the incubation period for Ebola can be up to three weeks. Now, she said it doesn't always take three weeks, but can it be up to? Now, one of the things about pandemics that I've learned in my research, and Dr. Orient confirmed this, a lot of them, and you're kind of alluding to this, will burn themselves out. If you get to a quarantine, the people who are exposed uh, early, then you can really kind of limit and you'll burn the virus out. The problem is, is there's multitudes of viruses coming in, and some of them are going to be carried uh, by mosquitoes. In fact, uh, uh, Barb Peterson, who did some research on horizontal transfer of diseases through uh, mosquitoes, uh, th this has now been engineered to make it possible. And in addition, uh, you have air travel, and they're taking these illegal aliens and they're transporting them all over the country, either by bus or by plane. So you don't have to wait, like in the old movie Outbreak, where it starts on the East Coast and works its way west. Um, it's going to be everywhere all at once. And well, I think and that's, that's, also, that's also presuming, Dave, that it is a natural outbreak as opposed to an engineered outbreak. Yeah, you know, I, I alluded to that with uh, Doug and Joe in the first hour when I talked about my former uh, FEMA contact, a uh, personal friend who went into hiding saying, we've got stuff out there that can be released yeah. uh, that, that will spread like wildfire and the world doesn't know we have it. Well, and the other thing, just as a, as a very rapid aside, uh, we know that we had the persons on uh, uh, MH17 that were going down to the AIDS conference, and one of the uh, subjects that was going to be voted on and discussed was whether or not um, uh, they were going to sign a document together uh, stating that the AIDS virus was a genetic, uh, genetically engineered, genetically targeted disease uh, developed in South Africa and, um, and you know, say that it was man-made. And, uh, you know, uh, I suppose we'll never know the true facts on that at this point with all those people out that just isn't going to come out. But, you know, certainly other uh, things that are out there um, could be of, of a similar nature, similar threat. Uh, at the very least, this population coming in great, provides great cover if that was going to be done or happen uh, out in the future. But, um, you know, I, I was looking at the gang members as, as being really almost like a virus just as a correlation um, where they get in here and get a root and get their, their systems in place before the actual coordinated action begins. And, and, and I think it is it, it's, it's similar to an Ebola. I mean, it's going to rip the guts out of the country. Well, one of the things that, that I looked at um, – and I used to teach military history a long, long time ago, um, is that the normal rule of thumb, it takes one soldier per 50 citizens to garrison a country, all things being equal. And the, I don't think the U.N. is going to be able to generate enough manpower early on to completely control the country. This is why I think you have to introduce pandemics and weaken a significant number of the country and reduce those numbers. But I think this is why groups like MS-13 are here. You'll have your blue-helmeted troops by day, 
and you'll have your terrorists by night going out and making political hits designed to preserve what's coming in. And you know in New York they ran an ad <clears throat> about three weeks ago for basically gun confiscation experts, and it's right out of their U.N. New York office. And before they do that, I said they have to have a false flag. And I've been racking my brain <clears throat> thinking about, okay, what could this false flag possibly be? And then I hearken back to a map that I've been in possession of. In fact, I'm in possession of the entire set of documents. I have a set of documents that was given to me by a retired member of the Department of Agriculture. And she came into possession of it because she was concerned that the massive war games that the U.S. Navy and Air Force were planning off every one of our coastline, including most of our territories, would be uh, detrimental to uh, crop yield. And so uh, she tried to draw attention unsuccessfully. And to the best of my knowledge right now, guys, I'm the only one in the country that has the map, and it's on the article right at the top, that shows this massive war game. Now, that map comes from an organization called AFAST, which is the sonar uh, aspect of the Navy. And what they're doing, all those rectangles on the map, and if people want to look at it, they go to commonsenseshow.com and look right on there, and you'll see the map pull right up. You'll see oblong uh, rectangles and squares and stuff, and it, it basically incorporates almost every aspect of the coastline of the United, three, United, three United coastlines except for the Gulf. There's some areas in there in the Gulf that are barren, and I think largely because those areas are destroyed from the Gulf oil explosion, uh, or they could be being left purposely open. So this, in 2009, the Navy announced their intention to do a five-year war game. No one does a five-year war game. No one. No one usually does a 30-day war game. And this is a, uh, a five-year war game, and I have uh, letters, and one of them is published in the article down in the bottom in the area I titled um, Appendix that's written by some of the congressional members of California, Oregon, and Washington. And in fact, later, this was joined onto by Diane Feinstein and Barbara Boxer and Henry Waxman. They added their names on at a later time. They wrote to the uh, undersecretary of the National Oceanographic Administration and asked him to stop the Navy from doing these war games because of all the mammals they would destroy with the sonar and the missiles and the drills and all this stuff. And NOAA turned them down. So they took their plea directly to the Secretary of the Navy, B.J. Penn, uh, and this is back in, I think, April of '09. and Penn just dismissed him, said, you're not going to tell us how to conduct our business, and told him to go away. Now, you would think that if the, the congressional delegations of Oregon, California, and Washington would come out and say, you can't do these war games uh, because they're going to destroy our coastline, they're going to destroy millions of mammal life, and this sonar is unwarranted. It's going to harm everything in the area. Uh, you got, you got to stop. You think this would make major media? You think this would be all over Fox? It would, but no. I, I mainstreamed researched this. It's not there, but I have all the documents, and people can satisfy themselves that I, I put some of those documents in this article this morning. Here's what it means, Doug, and this is where I think we can cut right to the chase here. The question I asked sarcastically and rhetorically in my article, are the ships facing the coastline or are they facing out? Because yesterday <laughs> I put the map in my article and, and I asked people, tell me what these, this war games are doing here for five years. And most people wrote in and said they're going to try to keep us from escaping when martial law comes. That was the most con consistent guess. And I think that's logical looking at the map, but it's not right. They're using sonar. What do you look for when you use sonar? You look for submarines. Big fish. Big fish, big fish that fire big fish. That's right. And, and if you want to take down the grid, and I don't think the entire grid's coming down. That's another aspect I'm actually writing about in tomorrow's article. The Chinese have weapons, EMP weapons, that they can take out localities. They can take out a section, a region, a state, or three-state area, but they don't want to take over a nation that's entire grid system is down permanently. And, and we're talking, if you took a grid down uh, in, in the most common way that people think of it, you're going to see a situation where you're not going to have much to inherit, 90% fatalities according to the Naval War College after two years. My congressman, Congressman Trent Franks, has been beating this bandwagon to harden our uh, power supplies and our power grid. 
you know, uh, against the DMP attack and no one's listening to him. I think he's being very responsible. I'm not a big fan of his, but in this area he's right. But these ships are out there looking for an EMP attacker. And, and there's no question in my mind that's what they're doing. And I saw some hard proof of this, too. But I'm hearing these reports that a lot of these ships are now out to sea on a rotating basis. This is an ongoing war game. I got the congressional letters and the documents and the map that show it. And yet, this is going nowhere. Now, why are they looking for an EMP attack? Well, I think the military is afraid they're going to be destroyed before the U.N. takeover. I think the U.N. is waiting to roll out their troops until they do an EMP that would cripple the military who might stand up and oppose their takeover. The prime directive of any institution, military, education, medicine, is to survive, stay intact, operate. And this is why I think we're seeing a lot of our ships and our Air Force and some Marine contingent involved in these drills, and I think they're opposing what's going on. Now, you know I've said this on the show. I've had my military insider sources said that there would have already been a major coup against this administration if they had the popular support of the people, but the majority of the people are too dumbed down. So in the article today, I said the military is not on the same side as the administration. And I went back and I recounted what I had reported a long time ago about how Admiral Guyette and General Ham, the commander of AFRICOM, Guyette, the commander of Carrier Task Force 3, two of the top four commanders in the Middle East, committed mutiny against Barack Obama by trying to rescue Ambassador Stevens. And the reason, and Jim, Jim Garrow said this to me, I've had other people in my confidential source arena tell me this, I'm going to try to save Stevens because he would have sung about drug running, gun running, child sex trafficking, all to raise money to support regime change, giving it to al-Qaeda, Muslim Brotherhood, and regime change in Libya and then, then in Syria. And that would have brought down this administration, which is what the military wants. But the number twos in the command of each officer arrested them. And in General Ham's case, it was a Colonel Rodriguez of the CIA. And Obama has done a lot of this, and I'm sure you've heard this, that in a lot of the major commands, Obama is embedding CIA people as the executive officer to keep a watch on the commanders. Right. He, assumed, he assumed command of AFRICOM it, it, uh, temporarily after that. And uh, I do not have the name of the man who arrested Guyette. My source would not give it to me. Guyette was taken. I do know where they took him. They took him to Bremerton, Washington at the base there. They held him under house arrest. And they said if he said anything, he'd disappear in the NDA, and no one would ever hear from him again. They'd just say he had a heart attack and bury him. Uh, and uh, that's, okay. what, that's what he told one of his sources, and it got back to my source. They allowed him to leave the military uh, on pretty favorable terms. And here's the other thing I wrote in the article today. These two men didn't decide unilaterally and arbitrarily to disobey a presidential directive delivered to them by Leon Panetta. They didn't do that. They had help from the outside. For them to launch a rescue mission, they had to have, have someone redirect satellites, make sure the traffic corridors were open, get traffic reports, get troop logistics reports in the area. They had to know what their troops were walking into. This was a coordinated effort for a military coup in the Middle East, just in the Middle East, not in Washington, not to arrest Obama, but just in the Middle East. Well, that coup failed. You know, and Ham's career blew up, and... Guyette's out of the Navy, and, and, uh, and, and unfortunately it failed. And I'm sure if Stevens was rescued from that, he would have known he was set up, because we know how many times he asked Hillary Clinton to increase his bodyguard patrol. When you, when you move forward from this event, you've got other situations to point to the fact that I'm right. Last November 13th and 14th, you had a drill called the Grid X Drill. And that was a drill where you had a simulated takedown of the power grid and how FEMA, DHS, and other agencies would respond to the crisis. What's interesting to me is they invited the Chinese and the Russians to participate. I almost couldn't believe my eyes when I read the NERC report on this. As they said, oh, yeah, our Russian and Chinese allies will be here. Are you kidding me? These are the same Russians and Chinese that were threatening to nuke us over Syria in the same time frame. Stay out of Iran or it'll mean nuclear war. 
Both countries delivered multiple threats, yet we invite them into a highly secure drill and basically gave them the keys to the car on how to take down our grid. Today I published um, a document. It's called a bilateral agreement between FEMA and the Russian Ministry of Defense that permitted 15,000 Russian soldiers to come into the country to train for emergency situations, martial law. These are your enforcement troops. They're here to seal the deal when all heck breaks loose. And then you have the Chinese side of it. The solar energy zones, to me, the discovery of what those were and the fact that they're over land that has massive mineral resources underneath of it is the most significant thing that came out of the te- uh, the, the Clay Van Bundy affair. Um, and we know on his ranch, Bingo. the Chinese were going to have a solar energy zone owned by ENN, which is a, a, a military corporation out of China. And this is a way they can bring in their soldiers. And the Chinese are being handed a lot of our solar energy projects. In fact, an article I wrote about Bundy affair back in April, I, I did a side-by-side analysis of the project in Arizona and the project in Nevada, and they're all the same, and the Chinese are at the heart of all of it. And this is a good way to bring in your troops in ostensibly what would be called an inland port. So the Russians and Chinese troops are here. The UN is positioned. We have massive immigration, a total open border, impossible pandemics that could put the country in absolute chaos. And I think the coup de gras is going to be an EMP attack. And I think the reason the military, a lot of the military, is offshore with regard to these military war drills is because they feel they'll survive an EMP attack. If they're on top of a submarine or a cargo ship that launches, if they're in that same area, they're not going to be affected because a submarine, say from China, Russia, or North Korea, who also has EMP weapons, they're not going to commit suicide. So I think this is why these war games exist. We're vulnerable. This is what uh, Trent Franks is talking about. He said, "Our, our infrastructure across all borders, in other words, I'm sure he's speaking about military, scientific, power industry, is all unprotected. In fact, let's jump to Yemen for a second. Yemen is an area where I think we just saw a, um, a false flag attack, and I think it was a beta test. Yeah, you were you were saying that before. I didn't mean to interrupt, but you were you were saying about Yemen before, and not too many people really understand what the heck happened there. Well, uh, in Yemen, there was uh, they, they say it was Al Qaeda that did it, but I haven't seen any proof that Al Qaeda took down the power grid of Yemen in one day. A country of 23 million people, and the power grid is totally wiped out in one day. It's just gone. I've got a picture of one of the collapsed power grids, and I'm laughing because I can't believe that people aren't on top of this stuff. In fact, but some people are. There are public references to an ex-CIA intelligence officer named Dr. Peter Pry, P-R-Y, and I link into the mainstream accounts of what he said. And what he basically said is what happened to Yemen can happen to the U.S. Pretty cryptic warning. And then I said, but if you think he's CIA and you can't believe anything the CIA says, just remember Operation Northwoods because the analogy fits. But here's a more even telling quote. In the Wall Street Journal, and on my article I have the link to it, FERC Chairman John Wellinghoff stated that a similar attack on Yemen, and this is a quote, would destroy that destroyed nine um, infrastructure uh, substations, okay, power stations, and transformer manufacturer. The entire United States grid would go down for at least 18 months or probably longer. We've promised the Chinese the hard assets of this country. The Pioneer Institute did an audit of untapped mineral resources estimated to be underneath the earth in the United States and they came up with a figure of between 128 and 150 trillion dollars worth of assets. This is why you're seeing the solar energy zones going over these mineral rich resources and the inland ports that the Chinese are being allowed to inhabit are in mineral rich re- area resources. They don't want to inherit a pile of junk. So I don't think we're going to see a total power grid take- takedown like we did in that NBC TV show called Revolution, 
where everything was gone. I don't think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see uh, surgical precision takedowns, and you'll see high-altitude uh, detonated nuclear blasts to do it in a particular area. And you can contain uh, the scope of your EMP attack, uh, and you can actually cause the whole grid to go down for a while, but you can bring back up most of it if you haven't destroyed all the component parts. And I think right. this, is, this is exactly what we're going to see, because the Chinese don't want to inherit nothing, uh, and they wouldn't be on board with this kind of plan. And I think this is what we're seeing. I think the military knows about it, and I think this is why they have their ships positioned where they do, so they're going to be largely unaffected by it. Okay, this, this war drill, it's unprecedented. It's a huge waste of money. Why are we doing this? I don't get it. And I've, I've gone through a million scenarios in my mind, but it wasn't until this border situation began to unfold, and I'm seeing the possibilities of us totally losing our con- control of our country to the U.N., predicated on a false flag. I was just laying in bed one morning getting ready to get out of bed, and it hit me. I said, the military is protecting itself. That's why they're not in country. I mean, think about the Army, our combat forces, 165,000 troops in Afghanistan. That's the bulk of our land fighting force. And then you've got these ships out to sea. The military is in self-protection mode. Okay. Um, Now, the question is, um, are they going to fight on behalf of the people? I don't know. And when I talk to my sources, I don't get real clear answers on that point. And I've expressed frustration to them on that point, too, Doug. I, I, I've told them, I said, well, come on, whose side are these guys going to be on? When, when the shooting starts and they're opposing the U.N., are they here to defend me, uh, to stay in my home against the Chinese or the Russians taking me to a FEMA camp? Outside San Salvador. And this is why I'm concerned about the illegal immigrants coming into the country. Um, You have MS-13, Los Zetos cartel, and the Sinaloa cartel training. And they're training uh, with Hamas. And I have documented this in an earlier article this month where uh, Hamas is supplying weapons uh, through the Sanchez Paredes cartel. It goes to the Sinaloas to control, and they do the training. MS-13 are now the assassin agency for these Mexican drug cartels, but they're no longer just drug cartels. They need to be considered to be military operations. They have anti-tank weapons and all the automatic weapons you'd have, and I've been told they have helicopters. And if you recall, we've had helicopters on two occasions cross the border and attack the Border Patrol. Right. Yeah, and, and, and also... This is something that all Americans need to be concerned about as well. What I learned from my uh, source is that the American military is training the Peruvian military, and they've stepped up their training. Now, what could they be training them? And these are narco-terrorists. Are they training them how to protect their drug shipments better? I suspect so, because what we also know is the military of our country is doing the same thing in Mexico. We're training the Mexican military. Now, if you want to have a a chance to have a Mexican military official who's not co-opted by the Sinaloas, uh, you go to the Navy and the Marines. They're not located in one area long enough to be co-opted, is what I've been told, on large numbers. But the Mexican military is overrun with a drug cartel influence. So, in effect, our military is training narco-terrorists with the Peruvian army that's running these drug and gun shipments, and we're also training the Mexican military, and I say ostensibly for the same thing, in a fast and furious kind of approach. Now, they're now sending in MS-13 by the tens of thousands into this country. What I was told by this Border Patrol agent, he said, we've cataloged 10,000 that we think are. Uh, He said, but we're told when we file the official report, you leave off the MS-13 and treat them like anything else. Even when they admit to murdering and torturing and all that, he said we're not allowed to use it by order of DHS. So we have these these, uh, MS-13 people coming into the country and being scattered far and wide. But here's a really ominous sign that this Border Patrol agent told me. He said, you'll be in a detention center. Let's say it's 50 by 50. And he said, you know you have three MS-13 guys, but you have a hold on their account. In other words, you can't move them until the hold is removed on the computer. But he said, when three of them become like eight or ten of them, then all of a sudden the hold's released, 
can we release them to the same geographic locations. So in effect, we are releasing MS-13 death squads throughout the country. In fact, I have Roger Brown on, um, a real prominent sociologist who's going to talk about some of this on my show Sunday night in the last hour. Uh, this is very disturbing. This says this to me, Doug, that what we're looking at in Mexico is if you want a police chief killed, a city councilman, a rival gang member, you know, you just bring in the MS-13, they do their thing. But well, we have these people coming into our country now. Can you say assassination of Joe Arpaio or assassination of some other prominent sheriff or a sheriff's advocate like Richard Mack, that this, this really oh, frightens yeah. me that we have death squads coming into the United States right now, plus the pandemic people. And uh, the money from this is coming out of Hamas. But where's the money Hamas is getting to procure the arms in the first place? The CIA. Oh, that's a great question and, and an obvious answer as well, yes. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and so... The CIA, I believe, is teaching West Africans to speak Spanish to blend in as an immigrant group to feel the board, fool the Border Patrol people. And Dr. Orient said that there's 100,000 of them. That's what the Border Patrol sources have told her. I asked my source, how many are there? And he said, a lot. I don't know the number. And he said, it is curious that they do, a lot of them do speak Spanish. And he said, some of them try to say they're like from Guatemala. But he said, when you question them further, you know they're lying. The thing I vacillate on, though, guys, is will the war come after the martial law crackdown or before? Now, I, to me, it would make more sense to get the guns out of American hands and subjugate America early so you can't oppose the war effort. Well, I, I agree with that. I mean, in theory. But how, how in the heck would they do that, though? And you're saying, if I'm hearing this correctly, you're saying, well, they would do this asymmetrically through perhaps an EMP type of, of a preemptive type of an attack. Well, I think we're going to get a two-edged sword. There's no question we're headed for pandemic releases and outbreaks. And I think that the excuse will be the immigrants and gee whiz we didn't know. But I will tell you, and it's something that I talked to Joe about earlier today, uh, we have stuff ready to go right now to release. And I'm saying some of the dark agencies on the black ops side he said, but there's chemical and biological weapons attacks coming. And he goes, this stuff drifts on the wind, and you should probably get some kind of protection. And I said, are you serious? He goes, Dave, we have stuff that even the Mossad doesn't know we have. And he specifically mentioned them. He goes, they know pretty much everything we do. They don't know. We have stuff that can literally change a person's DNA. We have stuff that can turn them into zombie-acting characters. And he said, watch this drill that we do in two weeks. And it was the October 31st, 2012 drill in San Diego. And I actually have this on one of my stories where people were dressed up with makeup artists to act like zombies, and they were being uh, shot down in a simulation. And it was a FEMA DHS uh, civil control drill in San Diego. And they reported it on the San Diego TV stations, and they made a joke out of it because it was Halloween and zombies and, and all this stuff. But I he remember said, that. Yeah. We, he said, we have the ability to make people behave this way. And he said, and we use the chemtrails, nanotechnology. He said, it's all here. And I said, okay, now give me the good news. I said, when is all this going to happen? He goes, you know, no one knows a time frame. He goes, but there's a reason I'm leaving now. It could happen next week. He said, I don't think we have two years. And that was October of 2012. Uh, and he says, it's, it's coming, Dave. He says, you know, I'm not going to say a lot on the phone, but it's coming. And he says, we're closer than you'd realize from what I'm hearing. And they're prepared to hunker down. And he knows that there are going to be troops running through um, the towns and killing people and taking people to FEMA camps. I mean, he's gone through the whole scenario with me. I mean, it's going to be absolute social chaos. There are people in, inside the government that are reacting uh, you know, like who recently retire, or whatever, they're reacting the same way. They know what's coming. Now, I think these poor guys on the ships, I don't think anything beyond uh, uh, below a captain's level rank would know any idea of what's coming. They just, they're just carrying out their mission. These people who are out to sea tonight and, and they're doing whatever they're doing in this mission, they don't know why they're doing it. I mean, we know more about why they're doing it than they do. But do I think their, their, their carrier task force commanders do? Yeah, I think there's probably a pretty good idea. They know what they're doing and why they have to keep the charade going. I have racked my brain over this, and I say, 
tell me something different. What really got me thinking this is going to be an EMP false flag attack are two things. The ships are out of the way by being out of their ports and should largely be unaffected. But number two, what happened in Yemen, and we have a CIA guy and we have the head of NERC saying this could come to America. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, that's why they're doing this. That's when it hit me. When I read the Yemen account, it rolled around in my head for a while, and I said, that's it. This is... This is going to be, and let me give you a timetable. If I were to write this as a Hollywood movie, here's what I would do. Scene one, we have an Ebola outbreak. Dustin Hoffman appears on the movie screen, and he shows the Ebola map that was in that movie called Outbreak 20 years ago. And Mr. President's going to be here in one day, and in two days it'll be here, and in three days it'll blanket the country. Here's what we need to do. And that real famous scene from that movie. So then you bring out the U.N. peacekeepers. And people aren't going to reject their help because the emergency rooms are going to be overrun. Hospitals are going to be filled. People are going to be told to stay home and treat your own. So here comes the U.N. all too willing to help. That's their foothold. That's their hold in the door. Meanwhile, you keep bringing in these fifth-column insurgents to support the uh, occupation force for martial law that they're going to be putting together behind the scenes. Now you need a false flag attack to take it from a medical intervention operation to a martial law occupation force, and I think the EMP is going to be one of the things that we see. Between July and November 14th, the Grid X drill, FEMA, DHS, and their ancillary organizations ran nine major disaster drills. And I've talked to people who understand this business. They say, we're lucky typically if we can do one every six months. And one in a year is not uncommon. And to have nine in that period of time, you know, one of the drills was um, they had 386,000 foreign troops, and I took this off the NEC website. So this is the website that writes these disaster preparedness drills that they publicize for FEMA and DHS. And one of the drills, they had 386,000 troops being trained in the following areas. Now, tell me this doesn't get your attention. One, how to speak English. And if you're going to occupy a country, you got to speak English. And number two, how to use American weapons. Gee, maybe that's where those 2.2 billion rounds of ammunition DHS is collecting is going to. That's oh. right there in their documents. They say that's the purpose for Oh, and they were training them in urban warfare. Wow. Uh, three for three, Doug. Okay. Drudge reported today. He's running a similar story that uh, uh, jihadists are going to take down the power grid. I think the disinfo right. campaign's already started. I say this to my Canadian brothers and sisters. You guys make great neighbors. I love your country and your cultures. You're just, you've been a terrific neighbor and friend to us all these years. We need to side together because your government is just as corrupt as my government. And, <laughs> and we need to be on the same side. Your leaders have signed the same agreements that our leaders have here in the United States. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wow.